Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our third virtual Social Work Month event. Today's topic is macro, social workers are essential. Today, you will have an opportunity to hear from three amazing panelists, and it will be moderated by our very own Dr. Lil Cheatham. And so again, thank you so much. Our uh, theme for Social Work Month is social workers are essential. And so to all of our amazing social workers out there, even if you're not a social worker, remember that the work you do, you are very essential to the work. And so today I would like to start out by, it, by passing the mic over to our very own interim Dean Reed. She will do the welcome and Dean Reed will pass the mic over the virtual mic, of course, to our very own Dr. Cheatham, and we will go from there. So sit back. Uh, we ask that you participate. If you have questions about macro social work or any any questions for our panelists, we ask that you use the chat and um, and, and uh, put your questions in the chat room. All right, Dr. Re Dean Reed, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Wilkes. Um, I welcome everyone here today. I'm really glad to be able to have this opportunity to spend an hour talking about macro social work. Um, those of you who know me know I hey, spent most of my career in a sociology department and my, my PhD is in sociology. And I, when I moved over to social work, I would jokingly say that sociologists are very good at pointing out the problems and social workers are very good at solving them. And I think macro social work is where those solutions to these big, large scale social problems um, really emerge from. I think macro social workers are essential because they have that ability to both identify the structural conditions that cause individual level social problems, but then also move forward to develop um, structural administrative policy based interventions that make positive change at, at, at all levels of the social system right down to individual people's lived experiences. So I'm really excited for today's panel. Um, my job is to both welcome you and also to introduce our moderator who will introduce the panelists. Um, our moderator today is Dr. Leah Cheatham, who is an assistant professor of social work in our school. Um, she teaches many of our policy and research classes. Her research focuses on the convergence of disability issues and youth well-being um, with particular attention to transition age youth. Um, she holds a JD and she draws on both her legal and social work training um, as she approaches her research with a particular interest in identifying practices and policies that promote social justice. And um, Leah is one of my research collaborators. We are working on a um, intervention program to look at the risks and needs that women who are incarcerated in um, the state of Alabama uh, face. So I know Leah um, as she wears many different hats. Um, so with that, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Cheatham. Thank you so much, Dean Reed. Um, this is such a pleasure to be here moderating this conversation. Uh, as Dean Reed says, um, I have the opportunity to teach some of our research and policy courses within the school. So I know that this is going to be an exciting conversation. I hope many of my students might be tuning in. Um, and I'm just so excited to hear what our distinguished panelists have to say today about macro social work. So before jumping into some of the questions to our uh, three panelists today, uh, please allow me to quickly introduce who we have here to speak with us. Um, first, we have Dr. Tracy Mims. And Dr. Mims is the mayor of the town of Webb, Mississippi. In addition to his mayoral duties, He's also a chapter vice president of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity and the owner of TTM Consulting Company through which he conducts diversity and ethics trainings. And if that wasn't enough to keep him busy, he's also coordinating social services for patients within Mid Delta Home Health and Hospice. Next, we have our own Dr. Karen Starks here with us. Dr. Starks is an assistant professor here in our UA School of Social Work. She's also the founder of a nonprofit organization, Community Entrepreneurship Institute, which, operates, uh, which operated a business incubator and a teen entrepreneurship program from 2005 to 2011. 
Given her expertise in nonprofits, I'll mention she also is uh, generous and passes down that knowledge to our MSW students with an, an elective course that focuses on how to start your own nonprofit. Last but definitely not least, we have Dr. Meredith Tetloff. Dr. Tetloff is an associate professor of social work at the University of Montevallo. Her research focuses on community practice interventions and her professional experience is primarily in the field of nonprofits, including work with refugee and immigrant families domestically and internationally, as well as youth development programs in Brooklyn and Atlanta. Additionally, in 2020, she was selected as a fellow for the Social Work Health Futures Lab, sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and housed at the Portland State University School of Social Work. So as Dr. Uh, Reed was sharing with us, Dean Reed was sharing, you know, the, the conversion of sociology and social work and how social work um, can really bring some big ideas to solving big problems. It's clear today that we have three panelists who are well poised to share some expertise around problem solving. Um, I'm excited to hear from everyone and their thoughts about macro social work. So with those introductions behind us, um, if we could start with you, Dr. Tetloff, and work our way backward, um, could you share with us just a bit more about your current role and how you um, integrate, you know, uh, work around macro social work within your current role as an associate professor at University of Montevallo? Sure. Um, so it's so nice to be here with you guys today. I'm very excited to hear from the other panelists as well. Um, I always feel like there's so much more to learn about social work and macro social work. Um, but the question that really has been at the heart of my social work, both you know, practice, research, social work, education, is how do communities solve social problems? Um, so how do we come together as groups of people to really assess and either prevent or um, help make lives better for people, those issues that really impact a, a great deal of us. Um, I'm very especially interested in um, eliminating or at least mitigating poverty and systemic racism. So those are the issues that I'm most kind of passionate about and spend the most time on, um, certainly in Alabama, and we'll maybe talk about the context of Alabama. Um, there is lots of opportunity to address both of those issues. Um, my undergraduate degree was in political science and my MSW was a policy concentration. So I very much gravitate towards um, legislative and political interventions. And I, you know, if I could say one takeaway, I hope that all social workers learn how to be um, advocates within the political arena and making those connections. Um, I do that currently really by partnering with organizations that I think are leading some of the most um, interesting and effective ways to make lives better for people in Alabama. So Alabama Rise, which I'll make some other pitches for, is an organization that within the state of Alabama I think is fabulous for social workers to join and participate in. Um, the NAACP, the Equal Justice Initiative down in Montgomery, there's lots of great organizations here in Alabama for us to partner with. Um, and so at Montevallo, it is, so Montevallo is the, we're the only public liberal arts school in the state of Alabama, which means we try to provide that small classroom experience at a more hopefully affordable, I know college is very expensive for everybody these days, um, but you get a little bit of that sort of private school experience, but at, at a public tuition. So lots of our students are um, non-traditional students in that they might be returning to school after some time outside of school. Um, they might be coming with families and jobs. About 40% of our students are Pell Grant recipients. So we have lots of students who are coming from low income backgrounds. Um, and I see that as part of my work as a macro social worker. So we know that a college degree can be um, a pretty important tool to preventing or mitigating poverty, um, especially in the lives of families, especially in Alabama. So Alabama, our graduation rate, we only have about 26% of the population in Alabama has a bachelor's degree or higher, which means a college degree could be really influential. I think all of us have seen in this pandemic with COVID, um, just how much of a protective factor that college degree can be. And so I'm very passionate and interested in how do we make college more accessible? And then how do we help students once they get to college, finish and get to graduation? Um, 
so so that they're not carrying that debt without the advantage of the college degree. So I've been working with some people at our university around thinking, what are ways that we can um, really maybe attract students who we've not served well in the past? So particularly students of color, particularly students from low income backgrounds. How do we make college more accessible? How do we shape it to fit their lives better? Um, and, um, and then I, you know, most of my practice I'm very excited came from youth development. Um, and so, you know, understanding and working, how is the context of people's communities and lives impacting their well-being? So I've got lots more to say, but I'll stop and let some of the other panelists explain their connection. Thank you, Dr. Tetloff. You're actually getting a, a shout out here in the chat saying that Dr. Tetloff was the first to introduce me to macro social work in undergrad. She's the best. So I just wanted to to echo that comment back to you in case you don't have a, a chance to catch it. Um, all right, Dr. Starks, would you like to, to share with us a bit more about your current work and how it relates to macro social work specifically? Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I wanted to, uh, when we were talking earlier about my, um, what I've done with um, around macro social work, I did my dissertation on African American entrepreneurs in the urban setting. And um, I remember when I was first doing it, some of the social workers were saying, that's not social work. And what we tended to find was that social workers, their research tended to focus on um, underemployment and unemployment, but not on employment. And I think uh, as was referred to before with the pandemic when we know that um, employment is just as important to the um, urban community, which was my area of focus as um, any others. So when I, um, after I um, graduated, I wanted to do my, rather than doing research per se, I wanted to put my um, work, my dissertation and the research that I had into practice. And so there in uh, Alabama, I was li living more in the Birmingham area. And so I started a business incubator there and had about 10 different businesses in that incubator. And the whole point there was to make um, sure that persons can uh, uh, rent their space. I think I rented it at that time for about $100 a month to give them a chance to build wealth because we know that when we're looking at what happens in entrepreneurship, a lot of the overhead tends to um, uh, sap away any money that they earn. So that was one of my goals there. And I also had a teen entrepreneurs program, creating that next generation. Um, I had um, about 10 students who were in my program ongoing, but I also would uh, volunteer over at the um, uh, high school there and, and then go ahead and work in the different classes. So with my teen entrepreneurs program, um, we start to realize what are some of the issues that are going on. And with my teens, um, in terms of what they did in, in creating their own businesses, what I tried to do with them is to instill the social work ethics that are important. And it has, it really worked for all of my students. But there's one um, in particular that people may know about because he's a national, probably international person at this, at this point. But if any of you have heard of the app Scholly that helps students find all of the free money that's out there, Christopher Gray was in my teen entrepreneurs program. And I don't take any credit for his success. When he came to me, he was like, you know, on it, <laughs> you know? So um, I was just another conduit on his way to, um, forming Scully. But what Christopher realized when we were all together, he said, well, he won $1.3 million in scholarships. And he used to tell me, Dr. Starks, I never should have gotten all that money. Everybody in our group could have gone to school with what he earned. But he put it to good use as we all see. You know, he's been on Shark Tank and things like that. So that when we start to look at what happens when we start to focus on those issues in our community, getting more people into entrepreneurship. And I'll talk a little bit later about entrepreneurship because I know it all sounds sexy, but it's work. And so even when I you know, do the nonprofit, everybody, students like, oh, I wanna start a nonprofit. And I'll talk about that, how when I start taking them through the process, they'll be like, oh, 
okay, and they realize, but it is helpful for them to know what a lot of other organizations, nonprofit organizations, have to do in order to uh, do their work in the community. So on that, you know, I feel that, um, you know, that they were able to then have a different understanding whether or not they decided to um, do uh, that. In addition, I think when we're looking at uh, why it's important, um, be, one other thing is that it provides an opportunity for us to do service, which is a big part of our work. And so even though I moved back to uh, Georgia, I do volunteer work over at South Gwinnett High School, give a shout out to them, and um, around entrepreneurship uh, with the uh, juniors and seniors there. And again, in college, it's about orientation and how students think about that and preparing them uh, for the, the job force, uh, the workforce as well. So that's why I believe it, uh, why macro is important. I started a co uh, Community Entrepreneurship Institute for that reason. And even though I'm not operating the nonprofit itself, I have started a business here called Idea Space, and I can talk about that a little bit later as well. But this is why it's important. When you're out there and you're working with the kids, going to the high schools and things like that, you start to realize what the needs are, and then you can help address those needs. Thank you, Dr. Starks. I also wanted to point out you have quite a bit of praise ringing out in our chat box as well. You might want to check that out. Thanks, <laughs> <from everybody>. <laughs> All right, thank you. Dr. Mims, you know, I'm not sure whether to call you Mayor Mims or Dr. Mims. I'm not sure your preference here. Um, it if you doesn't could. matter, just whatever comes up. <laughs> All right, Dr. Mims, if you would share with us a bit more about the work you're doing and how it relates to macro social work, please. Okay, uh, thanks for having me um, on the panel today. I've done quite a bit. Um, I'm a retired professor, uh, associate professor, uh, and director of the undergraduate program at Mississippi Valley State University. So to just give a little spill there, and then I'm gonna kind of move into the mayorship role. One of the things that I was really excited about was getting students engaged on, on, a, on a global level. So I created um, an international policy and diversity class and took about 30 students over to uh, the Gambia in West Africa so that we can do service learning and get engaged in that process. So that was an incredible experience for the students in terms of a macro experience. Now I'm gonna kind of fast forward to uh, the town of Webb because it is so cool, I tell you, being the mayor of a town and having a social work degree because you understand the needs and you understand how to apply particular things. So I've been mayor for eight years now I'm not going to run for another term, but I have been for eight years. So in looking at um, the town um, and helping people to understand the importance of systemic change, um, understanding knowledge around what is needed in the town to move it forward is very crucial. So I live in the northwest section of Mississippi. Uh, we're in what's called the Mississippi Delta area, very impoverished area is often referred to as the most Southern place in the nation. So we have a lot of social determinants against us. So I'll kind of just give a few examples of some of the things that we do in the town and trying to help people understand. So let's talk about surveys. So in writing grants, oftentimes you have to determine eligibility for that particular grant. So getting the community involved, whether it's through um, having town hall meetings, explaining to them the process of uh, why the surveys are important, that you complete them, complete them accurately, because this is gonna determine if we're able to move forward with a particular RFP. Sometimes you get citizens in the community that don't wanna share their personal information because they're thinking that you're trying to dig into their personal business, quote unquote, and you get a lot of that in small towns because everybody knows everybody. And let me, let me point this out. Just because we're small doesn't mean that we don't have to take care of all of the processes that a larger town does, because we do. So after getting that, getting the community to understand what is really needed around grants, so we go forward with these things. We just finished writing a grant for $330,000 with CDBG for water improvement in the town. 
And so helping the citizens to see that their input was very significant in us getting approved for those funds. Also, um, we look at um, human capital, uh, just created a reading corner uh, for students. We, we identify through community surveys and through interviews with the community on the west side of Tallahatchie County that there is a literacy issue. And so students are faced with having to pass that third grade reading gate. Uh, they struggle with that particular test before they can move to the next level. So we saw that an after school program would be something that would really benefit the students. So we created a reading corner and I've written a couple of grants with the National Leagues of City to sort of put books and mats and things that we would need in that center. So one of the struggles though, is getting the human capital in a small town, getting people that are wanting to come in and actually, you know, let the rubber hit the road. You know, a lot of people talk, you know, the noise, but nobody really wants to carry out. So um, trying to bring those people in and leverage human capital is very important. So the Reading Corner is now in progress and it does fill that gap and we are a support to the community at large because parents are working two jobs sometimes, you know, they and, and they don't understand how to carry out some of the lessons. So we have this group of people that are there to help. Another thing with, um, it's important to have social media uh, outlets for your community, very controlled in that sense, where they can actually drop concerns that they may have so that you can focus in on those particular concerns, having a website um, built. So I was very integral in, in that piece in the town. Um, community policing, that's, that's key. People in the community uh, oftentimes see the community as someone that's, I mean, see the police department as someone that's against them. So we wanted to create a friendly environment right there. So we have sessions where the police officers are actually communicating with the community to help them see that, hey, we're your friend in time of need. You know, we just want to maintain social control. And so writing grants to help support them through the Department of Justice, I've been a part of that, getting them the necessary equipment um, that they need. Also, the community is looking for fun stuff. So you've got to have the ability to network. You, you've got to know how to get out there and make things happen. So we do, we were doing this annual festival until the onset of COVID-19. And so it would bring together community members and people from afar would come back and it was like this big family reunion that they would have. So working at that level, you know, making fun for the community so that they can be a part of, of the process and be excited about what you're doing. Another population that I've been focusing on is the vulnerable population. A lot of the elderly don't really have a lot of things to do. So we're in the process of creating a hub downtown where the elderly can come in and actually share stories with some of the youth to kind of give a better sense of community. So one of the guys, he's gonna plant fruit trees and all of this kind of stuff. So to try to create a very friendly atmosphere where where the youth can come in and then the elderly can come and share for a little bit. So he'll be cooking out front, you know, healthy, of course, you know, we tend to want to eat the wrong things, but we got to eat right. That's, that's another big issue that we have in the Mississippi Delta. Everybody wants to do that fried chicken and throw the ribs and stuff on, but we got to do the right thing. So we're going to be talking, you know, uh, from, from that perspective. Also, I have a mayor's health council. And there's so many things, y'all. It's cool. Just like I said, being a social worker and doing this mayor stuff is just cool. So I have this mayor's health council, and we focus on health and wellness of the community. Right now, our big spill has been around HPN hypertension, uh, which is a comorbidity that we see a lot of uh, that goes along with CHF and C, uh, COPD that we have in the area. So we are, we are now doing a lot of education around that. Uh, we're doing... Um, uh, COVID testing uh, on April the 9th, we're going to be doing some vaccinations in the area and also knowing how to go. And I want the students to know this. If you're, if you're interested in macro level work, how to advocate, you know, how to go out and get the funding, how to apply for the funding, all of that is so very key. So I tapped into getting the funds uh, that helped our community with uh, COVID-19 essentials. 
you know, getting the face mask, buying the extra bottles of water, you know, just, just things that they would need and understanding and how to protect themselves. And trying to convey to the community, because you have some people that are very difficult to deal with at times. You know, so when we were talking about the mask at the beginning of the pandemic, you had some that didn't want to do that, some that didn't want to social distance, some that still wanted to have the social gatherings. So you have all these different facets that come into play that you're dealing with. And um, with, with um, my board of aldermen, they clearly understand the need. You know, they understand what it takes to actually move us along. So, and, and I can elaborate on, on this stuff more and more, and I can talk about it, you know, more in detail, but I'll just go ahead and pass the baton at this time. Thank you, Dr. Mims. You're, you're doing such an excellent job of illustrating all of the ways that social work, particularly macro social work, can play a role in almost any position, including governance, certainly. Thank you. Um, I'm loving the fact that we have our students here to hear all of this. You're, you're helping me within my advanced policy course as you speak, so thank you. <laughs> um, really, uh, you all have already begun to speak to these issues around why macro social work is essential, our theme today. Um, but I'd love to hear more from each of you, um, whoever would like to speak up first about ways that macro social work can serve um, to reduce inequities in society and promote a more just society. I think a number of you have already spoken about some of the different levers that you all have focused on through a macro lens, including health, uh, community engagement, literacy, academic success, wealth building as these mechanisms to try to promote a more just and um, uh, a, a more equal society in which everyone has uh, equal opportunities. So if you could say more about the role that macro social work has to play within those larger goals that align with our profession, um, I think many people would love to hear your thoughts about that. Is it okay yeah. if, if I start? Yeah. It's open. Go right oh, okay. Yeah, I thought I'd be like calling on people at this point. Feel free to jump in. Thank you. Okay. Um, one of the things I want to say before I get started talking further. Um, to the students who, who are sending information on chat, I've been looking to it and let me let you know, my heart is full. So thank you for that, for the comments, really means a lot. Um, when we're looking at um, what we do in the community and how we can then help uh, the community, communities at large and, and those things that are important to us, um, and I know that some of you out there are cl clinical social workers, and I would just take you back to what I, I was taught at Virginia Commonwealth University. You do both. You can be a clinical social worker, but you do macro stuff too. It is not that big of a separation in terms of what you do. And I think the thing that joins us all in that is the um, code of ethics around service and what is our responsibility to the broader community. So when we're looking at doing things and volunteering your time, if every social worker volunteered their time uh, or a part, you know, some of their time, it would really address some of the issues. So I want to just say that on the broader level, no matter what your area of interest um, is in terms of the uh, social inequities that are here, that you can help to start to, you can start to change that just by doing service, which we are all asked to do as social workers. And so, um, I, uh, like I said, mine was more is, uh, around entrepreneurship and getting more people <clears throat> into uh, starting a business in the sense because what my research found was that those black entrepreneurs and particularly those in the urban community, they hired their local people, um, people from the community. And then that helps bring in tax revenue and that helps to give them an opportunity that they wouldn't have gone. It was these entrepreneurs who bought the Little League outfits and gave scholarships for college and books and things of, of that nature. So that's why I think when we're looking at the community at large, why macro uh, social work is so important in addressing these issues, um, because that's what we were here to do. Um, there are people who are just maybe on a clinical track, and I don't mean social work, but some of the other area uh, um, uh, professions that may, may be just on the clinical track, but we, it, it is our responsibility to be broader. So I would just say, no matter what your interests are, you have an opportunity to serve 
and address that issue that way. Um, I, and it's not just for the community at large, but also it may be in terms of some of fellow social workers. And I'll just quickly add, you know, I said, I, um, one of the things that I found when I started my um, think tank, excuse me, my uh, uh, incubator was that I did not own the building. And so that person had control over what happened in that building. And so one of the things that I was uh, said I would do is uh, next time I would own the building. And that's what I did. I, I purchased a building here that was close to the high school. It used to be an old Waffle House. So the students can walk over when we have the different programs that are there. But I also extended that to provide um, low cost supervision and training for social workers who are um, having to get their CEs. So when we talk about macro practice, it goes out into the community, but it also looks at then how do we uplift our own um, profession? How do we uplift those that are around us? Because then that encourages them to go out and do other things and to go for what they want to do. So um, I, I will just say that, you know, um, the, the other thing I would just say just generally is go out here and tell people you are a social worker. I think that has been the biggest thing that we have not done is let people know who we are. And we're that, you know, we're, we're bringing it. So once you tell people who we are and you own that, um, then that then sets you at a certain place in order to um, have people to listen to you and also uh, really uh, strengthens the, the different things that you do in the community, regardless of your area of interest. Thank you, Dr. Stark. You're getting some quotable moments here in our chat as well. I think they'll be carried on. Maybe the, the social workers are bad is going to be another quotable moment. <laughs> I'm gonna hold on to that one. <laughs> Um, right. I just want to remind everyone, please feel free to, to type in some questions to the chat for our panelists. Um, I'll, I'll open this back up to either Dr. Tetloff or Dr. Mims if they want to weigh in about... Uh, I'll jump in if that's okay. okay. Please. All right. I, I think, you know, just taking it a bit further, it is so important for students to know, to understand the political landscape. That, that is so very key. Um, understanding uh, what is in your environment in terms of community organizations, how to tap into those things so that you can escalate to the next level. That is important. Understanding policy making and how to develop policies, how to write policies that are in sync with state and federal guidelines is so important that you, you connect the dots there. Because you can, if you find too many gaps, then you may experience some trouble right there. Understanding the historical context in terms of social justice and cultural sensitive, sensitive practice, that is key. You know, we, we, we have a diverse world that we're living in right now, so understanding those concepts. And how to develop, implement, and evaluate programs in your community. One of the things that I do, I've, I've worked as VP of business development for a home company, home health company, VP of sales and marketing, and now I'm helping write grants. So one of the things in going out and conducting some assessments on patients, I realized that the caregivers were experiencing a lot of role strain there. So I started to do surveys uh, with them and to do some interviews with them to just sort of look at some of the needs. I decided to write a grant with USDA for a distance learning program. It's called the Caregivers uh, Empowerment Program. I was funded for the grant for $182,000. So I'm looking to roll this program out in the fall of the year. So we are actually have, uh, we're looking at four counties in the Mississippi Delta area um, to target our participants. And we're looking to train 75 to 100 caregivers uh, through, uh, on a caregiver's empowerment curriculum. I have various professionals that are involved in that from pharmacists, medical doctors, uh, Mississippi Valley State University is major, a couple of the health clinics in the area. So understanding, you know, looking in your community and, and discovering where there is a hole and trying to fill that. I saw that, I went after it, I saw funding for it, I fund it, so now I'm ready to implement it. Of course, along the way, you're going to have to evaluate whenever it comes to those types of things. And I want to just say this piece here. 
ethical, be ethical in whatever you do. You know, um, you, 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 if you take the macro level path and you become a mayor or some other um, high level official, you have to be mindful that people will come to you from, from, from different angles. So you wanna make sure you remain your ethical um, uh, backbone as a social worker and don't get caught up in anything that would land you in an unfavorable spot like um, jail cell or something along that line. So uh, being ethical is really, really key. Um, and um, so, and I think you know, basically that's, that's what I would want to share. Just those few components right there about taking macro a little bit further. Thanks, Dr. Mims. Dr. Tetloff, did you want to share anything? So I would, yeah, I'd love to. And, and, um, and I'd really um, reiterate some of the things that um, Dr. Mims and Dr. Starks have shared, um, such good practical wisdom. Um, but I would say you cannot be an effective social worker, regardless of what system you're working in, regardless of your career, without paying attention to the systems within that people live in, which is really the macro component. Um, you know, we're committed to um, really eliminating poverty or trying to make lives better for people living in poverty and other vulnerable populations. And we know in the United States, and I think we've seen this really um, highlighted throughout the, the COVID-19 pandemic, that so many of people's problems are based in the systems. Um, so things that often look like individual problems, so poverty, addiction, violence, we can very often trace the root causes to the systems in which people live. Um, and so understanding those systems, um, and I, I really like Dr. Shark's advice of like volunteering, it doesn't have to be hard, right? I know that social workers work with very long jobs it's hard to find extra time to show up and do all this other stuff, but build those coalitions, join a group that's already out there, um, make those connections in Alabama. And I love having um, the mayor Mims here because I think local is really where we can have a profound impact. It's accessible. You can find your mayor, you can find your city council person. Alabama, our state legislature is so powerful. Um, find out who represents you, go to Montgomery or write them a letter, make them a phone call. Because regardless of what social work you're doing, the decisions that are being made in those places of, of power and influence are going to impact you from your salary to um, resources that are available in your community. And so understanding the, the connections, America is a country full of wealth and resources, and yet we have very high poverty rates. Alabama, I think we're about the seventh poorest state right now. We're always one of the poorest states. Um, most Americans will experience poverty um, at some point in their life. These are not problems that can be dealt with at the individual system. These are systemic problems. And certainly looking at our, our history around systemic racism, um, especially in the Deep South, and, and understanding that as social workers, you know, part of our responsibility is to acknowledge our role in some of the, the systems and the, the conditions that make life very hard for people. Um, but then we have that responsibility to see what can we do. And there's a whole bunch of like macro social work, you don't have to be a community organizer 24 seven, but join a coalition or do some local um, political advocacy vote, right? So find out who is representing you. And I think these are things that can make a big difference um, and I really liked, I think it was Dr. Starks that said, let people know you're a social worker. A lot of times when you're in these macro roles, um, they don't know that. I would love to see social work step up and be at the front lines of maybe some of this big social change um, and to acknowledge we're social workers. We have these skills. We have these passions. This is, you know, just um, who we are. It's at the heart of our code of ethics and making sure that we are participating um, in those efforts to make life better better for people, especially in Alabama, where there's lots of opportunities to make life better for people. Thanks, Dr. Tetloff. I, I love that you're kind of pointing out the um, false dichotomy between micro and macro, and we don't really need to declare ourselves as macro solely or micro social workers solely. We can just let people know we're social workers and work across the spectrum with whichever emphasis we choose. Um, we do have a question here from Morgan Grace, one of our BSW students. 
She was hoping to know, uh, when you started your career in social work, did you know you wanted to work at the macro level? And if not, and you started at the micro level, was that transition from micro to macro difficult? And this is to anyone. Feel free to jump in, whoever wants to take it first. Um, this is Dr. Starks. I wanted to do, um, I always wanted to do micro. But like I said, we were uh, oriented at, at uh, VCU to do both. Even though there were separate tracks, um, we always were uh, told it's both. It's neither, it's, it's never either or. So I, I've always had a macro focus, even though I'm a clinical social worker. And I say that for everyone as well. It's a part, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a part of our profession. Don't feel like you have to choose. <laughs> So I, was, I always wanted to be back row. <laughs> um, I, like I, I mentioned before, I was, um, political science was my undergraduate degree and um, I'm a law school dropout. So I knew I didn't want to do that. I'm a divinity school dropout. I knew I didn't want to do that. Um, it, thankfully, finally found my way to social work and, and found a school that had a, a policy concentration. Um, but again, I, I think that even um, the part of me that's very, you know, I want to make sure that people are experiencing um, joy and stability in their lives, but I just kept seeing those connections, um, even in mental health, which I know a lot of our social workers go into mental health. You know, there's a really interesting study that came out of um, Stockton, California. They were looking at a universal basic income. And so for a couple of years, people have been receiving pretty small amounts of money in the grand scheme of thing, not, you know, about 500 bucks um, a month. But we've seen decreases in anxiety and depression. And so even if you are passionate about that mental health component, um, how even a policy change like that can make a big difference. So, um, you know, I, I, I have lots of obviously friends and majority of our students are focused more on the micro side, but making sure that people know that regardless of where you're working, um, what's happening in the world around us is so important and understanding I mean, everybody will know this, everybody who's practiced social work, right? Once you get into a room with someone and you hear it's happening in their lives, you start to see those connections. Um, and so thankfully macro hopefully gives you the skill sets to do something about it. Just one other thing to add um, for those students who are in school now and looking at poverty, we know that poverty is very um, complex. And um, now with the new um, stimulus that just went out, in which uh, more people, even those who are unemployed, are being given an additional $300 per month. We see a broader um, amount that's given for uh, children. I would hope that maybe some of our students um, at, it, at any of the schools, at, at whether Alabama, Mississippi, or Georgia, would maybe in their policy class study the impact that that's going to have later on, because it is going to lift some people out of poverty. There was a um, study done by Urban Institute, I used to use in the class, and what they showed that even when there was intermittent periods where there was financial stability in these homes, the kids did better. So we need to understand that and take advantage, make sure that anyone that you know is taking advantage of these new um, policies that are coming out that, you know, whether or not you got your stimulus check and all of that, you know, um, unemployment check and, and that they uh, use their taxes and their earned income tax credit to help their families get the SNAP benefits to help their families. And I think if I'm not mistaken, they were saying that this is going to decrease poverty by about 40%. So this is big, and I hope that in the policy classes that this will be something that will be studied um, and going along with, you know, what we're looking at and how we address the biggest issue, which is poverty and all those other things come along, go along with it, the racism, uh, everything of that is in, embedded in that complex issue of poverty. Yes, and I would like to add also, and uh, linking to what you just said, financial literacy is so so key around that whole piece. But uh, to answer the question, uh, no, I, social work chose me. I have biology, undergrad student, wanted to go to med school, to be an OBGYN, found a job in social work based on something my parents knew, and then it just kind of went from there. 
So I was just all over the place. And as you can see, as I went through life, I um, did a little bit of it all in terms of social work. So social work discovered me. So I didn't have in the beginning, you know, that this is something that I wanted to do in my life, but here it is, I'm a social worker. It's always a for everyone's unique paths to social work and how you find social work or social work finds you. We have a couple more questions that I think might be um, a bit more brief, we'll see, uh, regarding um, getting more information if, if they were interested in going into more entrepreneurial activities. Uh, I believe this might be targeted more toward Dr. Starks, but I think it connects to another question later on regarding, um, or maybe a comment rather, someone mentions it's difficult to find supervision as a social worker if you want to work with policy. Um, so maybe touching on this with regard to entrepreneurship, Dr. Stark, but if others have ideas about ways to um, connect with those who are at the macro level when looking for supervision, that might also be useful for some of our attendees. Okay, I would say as far as entrepreneurship, uh, again, um, if some of you uh, can contact me through the university and um, and I will answer any questions and, and my number is there as well. And students for, oh Lord, been teaching about 20 years, have that number, so call me, just remind me you know, who you are and if I'm teaching you now or before, and I'll be glad to help you understand um, in terms of that. Like I said, entrepreneurship has that sexy term, but essentially it's starting a business. And it's uh, not as difficult as you think and so um, I can walk you through the process, and to, which I do a lot of times with uh, getting your LLC and choosing the name of your business and things like that. I do that all, you know, all the time. So I would be glad to do that for anyone who's in attendance and um, uh, uh, put my number in and um, email address there. Um, for someone who's looking into going into more macro around policy, I would just say find a mentor and one of the things, uh, there are some uh, social workers who are lobbyists, and so that you can look at doing that. And also, if you volunteer for a political campaign um, here in Georgia, I'm involved with Fair Fight, and by volunteering there and doing different things, you start to learn from, from people who are there. But there are social workers who are out here in macro, and I don't know if there is, similar to the clinical, if there's a society or a group of macro social workers and maybe Meredith may know that where you all can connect with each other. We know clinical social workers, we have those clinical uh, sessions, but maybe not so much for macro. Yeah, I will say this is one of my frustrations with social work education. Um, so the school I teach at, we have a, a BSW program um, and some of the requirements for the practicum experience make it hard to maybe find um, an internship opportunity that's more macro. Um, and so I think definitely what Dr. Stark says, like, you know, don't wait for it to come to you. You can seek these things out. Um, and I will say in Alabama, just a, one organization that I would say everybody should immediately join is Alabama Arise. Um, their whole purpose is to try to make life better for people living in poverty in Alabama and Carol Gunlack, who's their, um, one of their policy analysts is an MSW, she's a social worker. So, and she has had some, we've had some interns from Montevallo go there. Um, but I think those of us within social work need to put pressure on the institutions of higher education and um, places where there are practicums to provide more of those opportunities. I would love to see macro more centralized. And I think that's a lot of the push that's coming from macro social workers. Um, and for students, you are, um, you know, you're, you're your own agents and of change within your um, practicum settings, ask for these opportunities, volunteer to go to hearings, um, you know, sort of find out what's happening locally in your community, find the topic or the issue that you care about and what is the organization. I promise you there's somebody that's already working on it. Um, and find that organization and then see if you can get hours for it. I know, again, there's a limited amount of time, but, you know, talk to your supervisors um, and see what you can get out of those experiences. Like we give students credit for going to advocacy days in Montgomery and things like that. Um, but I agree it's tough and it shouldn't just be the student's responsibility. I think it's on us and higher ed to be more mindful about making this um, 
uh, not only easier to get to, but more of an actual requirement and central so that when folks graduate, they're, they're ready for it. So I hate that it's my job to try to bring this really interesting and rich conversation to a close, but we are approaching the end of our time together today. Um, if I could just leave everyone with a brief um, opportunity to kind of close out in sharing some of their um, recommendations to try to grow macro social work for our field, or even um, depending on what you're more inclined to answer, maybe talking about some of our larger challenges within macro social work and where you would like to see our profession focus energy. Um, but if I could just turn it over to each of you for about a minute to, to offer some closing remarks, I would really appreciate it. At your convenience, whoever would like to jump in first. <laughs> We're all waiting on the other. Um, <laughs> Um, let me just say, I asked um, one of my former students to put my number in the um, chat box uh, for people who want it. And I go by Dr. Starks now, even though Canada is up there. So um, some know me as Canada, some know me as Starks. Um, just in closing, when we're looking at social work, and when they're talking about macro social work is essential, just realize, um, and, I, and I guess I want students to focus on macro social work as, as part of their um, uh, education and to find and research out those um, practicum experiences. I know we have several that we use with students that give them more of that policy um, perspective in terms of what they're doing. But I would just say that no matter what you decide, whether it's macro now or more of a clinical focus, wherever you are, that you can always just do both. And as we go through life, it's gonna change in terms of where our interests are and, and depending on what may happen to us personally or professionally. So just do that. I will just leave it with, um, I had a professor at VCU who was wonderful. And one of the things that she told me that she changed jobs every five years. And when I met her, she had been on the city council. She was running a, an agency for you know the elderly and just doing everything. And I just took on that philosophy and I know I've been at UA for 20 years now, um, unbelievable even to me, but at every five year increment, I did something different. I started the nonprofit, I wrote a children's book, I bought um, Idea Space. And um, what I'm doing at this point, I just started a um, anti-racism think tank here in Georgia. So, you know, tell yourself that, you know, you don't have to be stuck at one level. Everything that you do, is going to inform your life and inform your practice and help you to do other things. So if you want to take on um, the philosophy of, of, even if you don't change jobs every five years, just changing mentality in terms of what you might focus on or where you give your service or your, and your time, um, I just think is um, we're in a profession that is wonderful because it allows for so many uh, varied things that you can do in your life and your career and the level that you can have impact. So um, yeah, we're, we're bad, we're awesome, we're change agents, we're, we're all of that. So just realize your power and get out here and, um, and, and do what it is that, that makes you happy but also creates social change. Yeah, I would um, reiterate all of that. I think that's such great, great advice. Um, I, I think out of crisis often comes opportunity and as devastating as this pandemic has been and continues to be and will continue to be, um, the, as Dr. Starks mentioned, some of the policies that have been passed in terms of alleviating poverty, it's, it's at least the biggest we've seen in my lifetime. Um, and so for social workers, thinking of the, the future around what can you do um, to participate in sustaining those policies. I also think we as a profession and a discipline need to tell the truth about our history um, and, and some of the ways that we have participated in um, mechanisms of oppression. And, as, and, and part of that truth telling is rebuilding and, and kind of repairing that harm. Um, and, um, and being mindful that the changes that are impacting social work are going to be unique. Climate change is already hitting, especially in the deep south. We've already experienced it and it's going to hit us first and hardest. Um, and so you, again, you can't 
you can't live <laughs> in these communities, much less practice social work without seeing those connections um, and, and really being prepared to find where do you participate um, in those things. I love that Dr. Mendes here, run for office. Um, you know, pay attention to, to what's happening in your local community. It's a fabulous way to make lives better for lots of people um, through your work as a social worker. Okay, I guess it's my turn here. As I stated earlier, you know, um, I work in the core of impoverished communities. So I want to say just being self-aware, knowing who you are, and being passionate about what you do is very key. I look in the mirror every morning, and I want to share this. And I look and I say, hey, boy, you know you're looking good today. I don't say it just one time, but I say it twice, you know, because I know who I am and I know the work that I do. So I say be very passionate about what you do. In terms of um, policy, that is so key. Pay attention to policy issues. Uh, pay attention to um, analyzing your people collectively, seeing what the needs are, just like I did in developing the caregivers program. You know, these people were struggling always focus on the sick, but not paying them enough attention. Such a critical need in the Mississippi Delta area. We've been talking a lot about poverty and financial literacy and things of that sort. So very key in the communities in which I live. You know, getting that stimulus check, but doing the right thing with it. You know, you may be receiving some other governmental assistance, you know, but preparing the right kinds of meals, you can do that. So it's, it's all about the educational piece. So being very passionate about what you do and, um, and, and let's, let's keep our universities um, in, in the forefront also in terms of curriculum and, and what is actually being taught at the university level. So be passionate, my people. If you're not passionate about it, uh, you're probably not gonna do a great job at it. Leah, can I just make one more comment? Oh, please, go right ahead. And it has nothing to do with all this, but I, I'm seeing, uh, getting texts from some of my students. All I want some of my former students to know is, Kenny is 19. <laughs> a lot of them were there from the beginning. So yeah, Kenny it will be 19 in April. So yeah. <laughs> it's nice to be able to reconnect with students, I know. <laughs> and I know they're happy to see you as well. Well, thank you all, Dr. Starks, Dr. Tetloff, Dr. Mims, for this really engaging conversation and for sharing your expertise and your passion. I know I've left more inspired to, you know, drive forward within the macro sphere of social work than ever. Uh, and hopefully many of our attendees are feeling the same. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it back over to Professor Wilkes, who's going to, to guide us around um, any housekeeping issues and closings. Thank you, Dr. Cheatham. Thank you, Dr. Starks, Dr. Tefla, Dr. Mims. My heart is full because I am a macro. I love macro. I've worked in communities and I live, love, breathe. I mean, it's such a great opportunity. And just some takeaways. Uh, you have an opportunity to serve. So wherever you can find an opportunity to, to join a coalition or, or serve on a board, serve on United Way, Red, Red Cross, you know, find an, op an opportunity in your community to join and be a part of. And I love what Dr. Stark said. She said, go and tell everyone, everyone that you are a social worker. We are bad. And this month theme is so appropriate. We are essential. We are so needed. So just go tell everyone that I am a social worker and own it. And Dr. Miam said, understanding the political landscape, you know, and, and we have to make sure that we understand like policy and the political landscape and all of that. So I can go on and on. This has been very rich conversation. Macro is at the center of my heart and I just love everything that I've heard today. And I have learned so much from you all and you all have really uh, uh, energize me. I, I really love education and I really love working in communities. And so, but I love this side as well. But thank you so much again, Dr. Cheatham, for facilitating a wonderful conversation. Dr. Starks, Dr. Tella, Dr. Mims, I hope this is not the end of our conversation today. And so I want to turn it over because I know some of you all are very interested in learning about your CEUs. And so I want to turn it over to Peggy Swales and then I'll come back and then Dean Reed will close us out. Great. 
thank you, Sharon. So um, echoing what Sharon said, this is wonderful. Um, so I'm an instructor here as well as a continuing education coordinator. And so um, everybody who registered will be receiving an email that includes the program evaluation as well as your CEU, your contact um, verification form for this program. Um, I'll also um, send with all the panelists um, permission, you know, their email. There's lots of still shout outs and, and questions about resources. So we'll compile that and put that in that email as well. So you all can have that information, how to, how to follow up. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wales. And so for every social worker, non-social worker, remember you are essential. The work you do matters. And so regardless of where you may be at this juncture of your life, remember that the work you do is very essential. And just want to give another shout out to our very own Mayor Maddox and the City Council. They proclaim March as Social Work Month. And so Thank you, Dr. Maddox and the City Council of Tuscaloosa, Alabama for proclaiming Social Work Month as uh, in March. And I wanna turn it over to Dean Reed to close us out. And thank you all for joining one last, our final uh, Social Work virtual event will be held on March 31st. So go on and register, we'll send out the information. It's men in social work. And so we have four awesome male panelists, uh, social work panelists, and we have a male, mo a male moderator. And so it should be rich and I know it's gonna be good. And, and so please come back and join us for our final social work event. And thank you again for joining us today. And I wanna turn it over to, uh, to Dean Reed. Well, I don't have anything I can say that hasn't already been said. This has been a great panel. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, and I will thank the folks that haven't been thanked. Um, thank you to uh, Professor Wilkes for continuing to organize and lead these events throughout Social Work Month. Um, thank you all for being here today and I look forward to seeing you at our, our next session.